explain the basic model setup, which is called a Poisson model, right? Poisson model based based on this Poisson distribution to model that the count numbers, the the dependent the, the dependent variables being those count values, count numbers, zero, one, two, the small integers, right? And then, but we said that there's a main important issue, a sort of like a key limitation of this uh, basic uh, Poisson model, which is what? What's the main problem? What's the main limitation of a Poisson model, the basic Poisson model? Still remember what is a Poisson model? Right, you model that. So Poisson model, you know, I mean, just without a formula, can you describe like in a single sentence? How did we? Model those count values through a Poisson model. Poisson model, the y variable is what? Those count values, count numbers, right? Zero, one, two, three, those counts. So, how do we model that? How do we model this, uh, the probability of y taking those different count values? How do we do that? You know, again, many of you asked me about the possible you know, questions in the homework, right? Or in the, in the exam. So to prepare the, for the exam, you should know those type of things. All right, so basically, how we model the Poisson model, you do not necessarily need to remember, memorize that exact formula of that Poisson distribution, but you roughly should have an idea of what Poisson model is, is set, you know, what Poisson model is, is about. You know, how is Poisson model set up? All right, if I want to test you that formula, I'll give you that formula, I'll tell you, okay, Poisson model according to that test that this should be. But you should have an idea of that, uh, you know, what Poisson model is about. How did we model Poisson model? How did we model those uh, counts for the, for the dependent variable? The Poisson distribution, right? We model the probability of we seeing that Y variable taking those integer values according to that Poisson distribution. Right, Poisson distribution, the formula-wise, that's this one. Formula-wise, this is the Poisson distribution. All right, so the probability of a y taking a certain integer, k, being zero, one, two, three, all the way to, all the way to infinity, is equal to this. This is the probability of y being equal to any of those non-negative integers, k. All right, and then this is the, this is the probability measure. We, we talk about that actually. We can show that if you add up all the non-negative values from zero all the way to positive integer, these values will add up to one. So they are valid, and each of them is non-negative. It's greater than zero. So that makes them these are the valid probability measure, and make this whole thing a probability distribution. All right. So this is the problem. The bottom model. The first step is that we actually model the value of y following as following this Poisson distribution. Now next, it's a Poisson model, right? So it's a model. So we model this y as dependent on a lot of x variables. Then how do we incorporate the x variables? How do we model that how those x variables would affect the possible values of y? Again, these are something you should have in mind, right? When preparing for that exam. How do we model that? How do we incorporate? What do we often call that? We incorporate the covariates into your model, right? Covariates, those x variables are oftentimes we call covariates. How do we incorporate those covariates? Or how do we incorporate those independent variables into our model? You know, in Poisson model. For the Poisson regression, about for the Poisson distribution, what is the key parameter? Lambda, is that the lambda determines what? Excellent, both the expected value and also that variance, right? Expect the value of y of that count variable and also the variance of that count variable, all right? So that's a key parameter. So in Poisson model, Poisson regression model, how do we incorporate all those x variables? It's by setting lambda equal to a function of all those x variables. But what function do we choose? Because lambda is non-negative, so we need to make sure that it's non-negative. So that's why we set this uh, lambda as equal to exponential of those regular x-beta combinations. 
All right, so linear combination of x and the beta coefficients, but we put that inside this exponential function to make sure that this entire value is non-negative, it's always positive. And we set that as the lambda of the Poisson distribution. All right, this is how we link all the x variables to y. Okay, again, y follows this Poisson distribution, the possible values follow this Poisson distribution, you know, according to those probabilities. But then, for this Poisson distribution, we set lambda as equal to all those x variables, you know, in the combination. So for this, in this way, actually, if those x variables value change, they will change lambda, and as a result, they will change the distribution of y. All right, this is the basic Poisson setup. And then how do we estimate that? We estimate that using that usual MLE, right? Because for each observation, you observe all the x values. And then plug that in, you get the lambda, lambda i, right, for that particular observation. And then given the lambda i, you can say that what's the probability of me observing this particular y i count? All right, so then that's the likelihood. And then we write out the likelihood for all observations and then multiply them together. And that's the overall likelihood. And then we simply just maximize, find the beta values that will maximize the likelihood. Okay, so that's the basic definition. So then, what's the limitation of Poisson regression? We already mentioned that. The lambda, right? So that's the same for both the expected value of y and the variance of y. As a result, the Poisson model implicitly assumes that the expected value of your y count must be the same as the variance of those components. All right, so that's the implicit. So Poisson model is reasonable when your data follows pretty much that pattern. Okay, so that's why we need to investigate in order for us to make sure that whether the, the, the you know, Poisson model is a good fit for the particular problem that we are studying, you need to take a quick look, a quick check at the relationship between the expected value of y of the dependent variable and the variance of y to see if they are similar to each other. If they are similar, that's okay, also it's a uh, reasonable approximation. But if the variance is significantly greater than the expected value of y, that's what we call over dispersion. And this is a very common phenomenon in, in, in real data. So if that's the case, actually, also is not a good fit. Right? So we need to think about how to extend also to better fit. Of course, there's another possibility called under dispersion, but under dispersion is rarer, right? Over dispersion is more common. You know. So then, how can we quickly test that? We talked about this uh, last time. All right, so basically, we just simply can calculate the, dip, the ratio between variance of y and the expected value of y. Calculate that ratio, you know, this uh, sigma squared, so, and see if that ratio is uh, close to one or not. Supposedly, it should be close to one. But then you, you, you do the calculation, you do the estimation, this ratio is estimated to be much larger than one, right? For example, 10, or even on a larger scale, that means there is significant over dispersion. All right, so then how to estimate the sigma squared? You know, this is, we have this uh, consistent estimator of the sigma squared. So basically, it's just the ratio. You see, here, pay attention here. You know, in Poisson model, what is y hat? We encounter this y hat a lot, right? So starting from linear regression, what is y hat? The predicted y, right? So predicted y basically is the x beta combination. We plug in beta hat, right? So then we get the predicted y, y hat. So that's a linear regression model. That's very clear. Then in the binary response model, what is y hat? In logic model, what is y hat? Also predicted y. But that's what y is binary in that case, right? So you know what? Then predicted y is, is actually what? Expected the value of y. Okay? Is expected. Remember, actually, y hat is always the expected value of y. But in linear regression, expected value of y is simply equal to that linear combination of x and beta. But in binary response model, expected value of y is equal to what? Y itself is either zero or one. So expected value of Y is equal to the probability of Y equal to one. 
All right, for a binary value, we take the expectation it's always equal to the probability of y equal to one. So in other words, we can say it's just the probability of success. All right, so that's the binary response model. And then we talk about, you know, similarly, you can derive that term, expect the value of the, the, the token model, the standard model. But here, y hat is what? Also expected the value of y. But in this supposal model, what is expected the value of y? Because it's that it's that lambda, right? And in the impossible regression model, how do we model lambda? Excellent, right? Exponential of x and beta. So that's exactly what we have here. So for y hat, it's simply just the exponential of x and beta. Okay, but of course we plug in the beta x. That's why that. All right, so make sure you understand what it is. This is expected value of y, given that term, particular observations x values. All right, so for each i, you can calculate y hat, y i hat. Right, calculate it. All right, so this is, this is actually the estimate, right? So it's the variance, and this is the expected value of y. And we take the ratio, and we take the sample average. All right, so this one is just a degree of freedom adjustment. It doesn't really matter, and n is really large. You know, basically, you just, it's, it converts to the simple average. But yeah, usually we will do that sample degree of freedom adjustment. So this k is the number of uh, coefficients, number of uh, x variables in our model. Right. n is the number of data operations. Yeah, usually n is very large, so this minus k minus 1 doesn't really matter that much. All right, so basically we can calculate this. This is just what's available. After you estimate the model, right, you have this beta coefficient, and then for each observation, you can do this calculation, and then you do this overall calculation, and you get the estimator of this sigma square. Again, you need to check whether this sigma square is close to one or not. If it's close to one, it's okay. But you just do the Poisson model. But if not close to one, it's significantly greater than one. I would say maybe say greater than five, you know, 10, then, this uh, the, uh, over this question. Right. So then last time we talked about that. What if your model is over this first? How can we account for that? Basically, your model, the data, right, in the in the dependent variable, this dependent count variables, you actually have more variance than expected value. So you have more variance than what can be explained by a Poisson distribution. Essentially, that's what uh, you the problem that you have. Then how can we Incorporate, allow the model to handle more variance in that outcome. Right? The idea is through this so-called random effects. All right, in the individual random effects, we allow each observation to have additional random effects, like additional random noises beyond the basic Poisson distribution. And so that's the idea. You see, last time we explained that. Right. So now for each y i, the expected value of y i. Right, the basic Poisson model would simply say the expected value of yi is equal to exponential of x beta. Right? But we want to add additional noises, additional variance, right, beyond that, in addition to that. So how do we do? We add one more coefficient in the first, and we let that coefficient to be individually different. You see? So this is called individual random effects. All right, so we, we allow this, let this to be individually different. So basically, this adds additional extent of variance into the model. All right, so that's the idea. And then with this new, this individually, you know, different coefficient is assumed to be following this so-called gamma distribution. All right, why do we do gamma distribution? Because this one has to be non-negative. Because this whole thing as a whole determines the expected value of y, which should be non negative. Alright, so we want a random variable to follow a non negative distribution. So then, of course, there are more, you know, multiple choices, but a you know, very popular, very common choice for those type of distributions would be gamma distribution. Alright, it's like if we want a distribution for any possible values, then we would, would probably just choose normal distribution. Same thing here, you know, we want this uh, random variable to be non-negative. 
then we'll just choose this gamma distribution. Gamma distribution is very flexible, as you see, you know, by those different coefficients, you can approximate any, you know, different type of distribution. And you see the normal term, you know, if you choose those uh, kind of a common thing, you know, you can actually restore that sort of bell curve, right, similar bell curve as what we are familiar with the normal distribution. But the good thing is that it's always not negative. We start from zero all the way to positive infinity. All right, in that sense, it will not be symmetric. It will not be totally symmetric because it ends at zero. It won't be less than zero. So it's different from normal, right? But it can be very close to the usual normal curve. All right. But now, here, for our model, again, we model this mu i, the coefficient for each individual to follow this gamma distribution. So basically, for each individual observation i, right? So we'll draw a random value from this gamma distribution and make that as new i. All right, and then, you know, we have this xi, the x variables value for that, in, uh, for that uh, observation, right? And that will determine the exponential of x i beta. And then new i multiply that exponential of x and beta. That becomes the lambda i for that particular observation. All right, and uh, the y value, y i, simply follows the Poisson distribution governing by this lambda i. Is that clear? That is the model setup. Okay, now for this gamma distribution, normally the most common, most general generic form of this gamma distribution, there are two parameters, two distribution parameters. One is called the scale parameter, one is called the shape parameter. All right, but uh, for our sim you know, simplicity, for this uh, the negative binomial model, we keep it simple, we combine this, we, we allow them to be the same. So alpha is equal to beta, and then it's denoted as theta. So then this theta is what we call a dispersion parameter for this negative binomial distribution. All right, so now pay attention to theta. What is theta? You see, theta, you know, given this is the generic form of this uh, gamma distribution, the PDF function. Okay, and then once you set r by equal to beta equal to theta, then you can write this PDF function as this one. All right, again, those are the just expressions. You don't need to memorize that. I will not pay attention to that. But make sure you know these two values, important values. The expected value for a gamma distribution with r by equal to beta equal to theta is equal to one. But what's more important is this one. The variance of mu is equal to what? one over theta. Now think about that, what does that mean? If theta is very large, what will happen? Let's say if theta very large goes to positive infinity, what will happen? Exactly, one over theta goes to zero. So as a result, the variance of mu goes to zero. Now think about it, what does that mean? Exactly, variance of mu, mu, what is mu? It's mu i, the distribution of this individual random effect. If the variance of the distribution of mu goes to zero, what does that mean? It is concentrated at the mean, at the expected value, which is what? What? And what does that mean? Basically, you can think of all new i is equal to one. Then if all new i is equal to one, then what do we get? What do we get? The Poisson model, exactly. So then, the negative binomial model, the whole, you know, the extended model setup actually reduces to the original Poisson model. All right, when theta goes to infinity, positive infinity, no more additional variance beyond the basic Poisson model. So the whole model reduces to that Poisson model. All the variance becomes to zero, so all the possible value of new i actually concentrate at the mean value, which is one. So then it reduces to that regular Poisson model. Question? Uh, what's an advantage of using the Poisson model and not always using the negative binomial? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, actually you could. You could, you could always estimate the negative binomial model because it sort of incorporates the Poisson model. Right, so I mean, if your data doesn't have uh, uh, over dispersion, then you can, you know, you estimate a very large theta band, right? So then, you know, you don't need to worry about it. Yeah, that's a good question. Anyone can answer that. 
then why do we, you know, then why don't we just simply introduce natural binomial mode? Just forget about Poisson mode. We always add to the estimate of natural binomial mode. I mean, if you ask the people dealing with counter data problems, I mean, still, the Poisson model is a more common choice. So why? Exactly, simplicity is always the benefit. Right, so it's easier to estimate. It's simpler, it's faster to estimate. And also, you know, a general principle. If something is true and it's simpler, we always want to go with the simple model because it's more efficient. All right, the variance, you know, of the, the estimator is smaller. The model is more efficient in, in, in statistical sense. All right, if, say, you add, make it a more complex model, it's always, you know, less efficient. The variance is the variance of the estimator is always larger. So the only reason we want to introduce a more complex model is because the simpler model is not correct. Alright, so this is the usual trade-off between the so-called consistency and the efficiency. Okay, sometimes you introduce a less efficient model, but it's consistent, it, it's correct, it can correct for the potential bias. You know, sometimes a simpler model will, will, will be biased. But of course, if you know that the simple model is correct, we should always go with the simple model. All right? Yeah, but yeah, good, good question. Okay, now back to that Poisson setting. Theta goes to positive infinity, we know. Now think about that. What if theta is very small? Here, theta has to be positive. All right, theta cannot be negative, so theta has to be, to be positive. So when theta is very small, so that means it converts to zero, then what will happen? Then one minus theta is very large. Then the variance is very large, right? The variance is very large. Is this is this mu i is widely distributed. Mu i can take any value, right? So it's distributed widely, and as a result, there's a lot of variance introduced into y, right? Much larger variance introduced into y beyond the regular Poisson distribution. All right, so as we see, the theta coefficient, right, when can it properly account for this over dispersion pattern? When theta is very small. All right, this is the inverse relationship. So when theta is very small, you have over dispersion. When theta is very large, there's no over dispersion. Is that clear? Okay, so when theta goes to positive infinity, what does this variance go? Zero. Right, so variance is variance equal to zero, what does that mean? There's no variance. No variance, then how does this distribution look like? I don't know the distribution is when the expected value is equal to the variance. Yeah, yeah, so that's the basic Poisson. But now we are talking about negative binomial model. We are introducing extension to the basic Poisson model to break that time. So we want to introduce additional variance into y so that we'll have more variance than that expected. So this additional variance is introduced by this individual random coefficient which follows this gamma distribution. So but that's why when theta is positive to infinity, the variance of that individual gamma goes to zero. So basically we have no more additional variance introduced. So then it reduces the basic form. Okay, so that's the, that's the setup. All right, so yeah, I think from this, it should be very clear, right? So just you understand that this, uh, you know, the, the source of this, uh, why this theta is called the dispersion parameter, right? So what role it plays in this whole negative binomial distribution? And just from here, from this origin, it's very clear. It's just right from the core of our setup of this binomial, negative binomial model. All right, and then we saw the text, you know, talk about the last time, right? So given this setup, how can we derive the probability of y taking each of those different uh, components, zero, one, two, three, right? So those probability, how do we derive those probability? You know, this is, we can derive that. So the difference is this, the, this one, this additional, this uh, coefficient, that, that the random coefficient that we need. But like we said the last time, the random coefficient it's just sort of imaginary. It's hypothetical. So we do not really model, observe that in the data. So 
no way we can say, oh, that the probability of uh, you know this new I equal to something, right? Because we don't really know more, no more of that. So we don't really observe that. So what we can do is we only observe y, y equal to the you know count that we observe in the data. So what we do is when we derive the probability of y equal to this particular count as observed, we will have to integrate out all the possible values of the new i. Right? But what do we know? What do we know is that this new i follows this gamma distribution. So we can just integrate out. This is like taking the expected value over mu i. All right, so that's the idea. So basically, we can just derive the probability of y equal to k following this selective binomial model as this. This is a Poisson, Poisson distribution, right? The probability density of Poisson. You see, but now with the lambda, the expected the, 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 uh, parameter replaced uh, by mu times mu. All right, not only mu, mu times mu, right? But then, Mu is what you observe from the big data, right? Mu, once you have x, you have exponential of something. So mu you know, but the, uh, the mu you know, but mu you do not know. So we integrate out the possible value of mu following this gamma distribution. So this is the PDF of the gamma distribution for the possible mu value. And then we integrate that out. So this is just the usual expectation. I will take the expectation of this one over that mu distribution. All right, and then you can play with that. You know, you can derive it on your own. I mean, just to you know remind you of how to do those integral, integral by parts. All right, those things you know you can change a variable. Yeah, play with that. You know, and then you can do the derivation, and then after a few steps, you can derive at this formula. This is the PDF of negative binomial distribution. All right, the probability density function of negative binomial. And here, this this is a gamma function. Anybody knows what is a gamma function? A gamma function. Do I have the question in there? No, I don't have that in the four slides. Yeah, but you can look that up. Gamma function. You can think of that as a generalization of factorial. All right, into this uh, continuous, continuously, continuously. You know, continuous value the variable. So this gamma factorial you can only have you know n, right? So n factorial. But the gamma you can take any continuous value, and then it's just like gamma x plus one is equal to x times gamma x. All right, it, it has that uh, you know relationship. So then you can have the you know you can keep through that and it's like a factorial. But anyway, it's just a no function of you know whatever value you specify. All right, so it's you know it's just a non function. So here, what you really do not know is what you you know all the values you know, right? Theta is the parameter. Theta is the model parameter, right? So once you estimate the model, you know that. And here, the mu i is what you're gonna substitute in. All right. So once you have this, uh, you know, this one distributed, how do you develop the model? The negative binomial model. How do you introduce all those uh, x variables, all those covariates, into this negative binomial framework? Again, the same approach by linking this mu, right, to exponential of x beta. This part is the same as the Poisson regression model. All right, you link this uh, mu, right, the mean parameter to x variables through this expression. Okay, so then you know you substitute in this uh, exponential of x beta, you know into this uh, PDF function, so that uh, you know this uh, uh, mu is replaced with this. Okay, and then you basically have the probability density, right? So for each observation, you know all the xi, right? So then you know mu, uh, you know mu, and then theta is another parameter of the model to be estimated. So you know theta, and then you know, and you observe the yi, right? The yi values. And then you know the probability of observing that particular yi for that particular observation. And then how can that model be estimated? Same thing, right? So now you already know the probability of observing the yi for each observation. So you can write out that likelihood function. Right? And then what we how we estimate those coefficients is by finding the optimal solution to maximize that overall likelihood. 
Now, what are the coefficients here to be estimated for negative binomial model? The usual beta coefficients, right? But in addition to the usual beta coefficient, what else? Yeah, this is also something I'll test you. All right, so for some for a negative binomial model, what are the coefficients to be estimated? Right? Of course, the usual beta coefficient. But in addition, what else? What do we have here? In addition to beta, theta. Right? So the theta is also a parameter, model parameter to be estimated. It determines the dispersion of your negative binomial distribution. All right? So you have all the beta plus theta. This is in addition to the bottom regression. All right, so as we see here, both for all the betas, you know, but here, pay attention, beta has also has that beta zero, the intercept, right, and uh, theta. So yeah, I can also ask you this way, if we have x, you know, we have k number of x variables, right, then for a negative binomial model, how many coefficients we're gonna estimate in total? Plus one? If we have k x variables, how many coefficients in total we're going to estimate for a negative binomial model? Excellent, k plus two. K plus one, one is this uh, intercept, and then plus theta, so k plus two. All right, so always when you have, even for linear regression model, when you have k independent variables, you always estimate k plus one beta coefficients because that plus one, that one is the intercept, beta zero. Right? But here, you, in addition to those, you also have theta, so k plus two. <coughs> All right, so that's the thing. And uh, yeah, this is just uh, to explain to you, if you are interested, you can just look at the derivation, actually. It's interesting where this name comes from, right? It's called the negative binomial. So you can derive from this, you know, Bernoulli 12, you know, and you can derive that uh, probability density, you know, so that, uh, but this is totally different from more data. It's just where the name comes from. All right. Next, uh, what we want to do is that with that, all right, so this is the probability, right? So then, let's say this is the probability. So what if this uh, theta goes to positive infinity? We already know, right, based on our discussion, when theta goes to positive infinity, this negative binomial model will converge back to the Poisson. But here, let's double check to see what happens to its probability density function, the PDF, when theta goes to theta. So we know this is the PDF of negative binomial as what we just dis dis derived here, all right? So you see, this PDF, if theta goes to positive infinity, what happens to this PDF? This part we just copy that, right? And what happens to this term when theta goes to positive infinity? When we take a limit of theta goes to positive infinity, what happens to this term? It approaches zero. It goes to zero, so that's it. This one, right? Theta goes to positive infinity. This time, this thing goes to zero, right? So it's one tiny, a little bit beyond one, okay? But the problem is, it's this value too an expo exponent to the power of theta. All right, so although this value converges to one, but still you take the power of something which goes to positive infinity. So then that's tricky, right? So what value does this whole thing go? It's 1.0001, but to the power of positive infinity. Mm -hmm. so actually, yeah, here if you pay attention, it doesn't converge to one. All right, simply because you are taking, if you don't have this exponent, it converts to one for sure. But now you have this exponent, the power of something very large. Actually, this is where that uh, magic constant comes in. This E, the Euler constant. So the ex ex limit of this expression actually converts to E, this constant. Yeah, this is very magical, E, 2.7 something. Yeah, you can try. All right, so one plus a very small number, but then to the power of, you know, the inverse, a very large number. Eventually, as theta goes to positive infinity, it converges to that Euler constant, E. 
All right? So this one goes to E. But here you have the mu, so basically it's E to the mu. All right, is that clear? Can you write that out? Yeah, this is the relationship to keep that in mind. All right, so that's actually where this, com this constant comes from. All right, remember that relationship. One plus one over theta to the power of theta. As theta goes to positive infinity, this whole thing converts to E. All right, which is equal to 2.7 plus. Again, in finance, this is infinite compounding. All right, so you can think of this as the, the period of compounding, and this is the interest rate. And then the 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 the, the, whole, the whole period, the infinite component, you get the e. You know, if you calculate like the future value of financial asset, you constantly run into this uh, expression. All right. Okay. So then for this reason here, we have a new mu, so that's why it's an e to the u. I is to basically you do that uh, change of variable and then it's into the new. All right. So this term is one over e to the new. Now, how about this one? The turn in the middle. And so that converts to one. Because the reason is because, you know, as I said, this is like a factorial. So this is like multiplied by theta plus k minus one times theta plus k minus two plus theta minus k plus, you know, three, right? All the way to theta minus one. So basically you have like uh, additional terms, you know, like the k terms. You know, involving theta. So that's why when theta goes to positive infinity, you know, the plus minus all those values after that doesn't matter. So you know, basically, just as, you know, how many terms you have with theta matters. But you know, the numerator and the denominator have the same number of terms. You know, involving theta. So that's why they eventually converge to one. All right. So that's why this term in the middle converges. So now. This is what happens to the PDF of a negative binomial model when theta goes to positive infinity. You see, what does that converge to? Converge to this one. And does this look familiar? That's exactly that PDF of Gaussian distribution. You see, so from here, from the PDF, we can also derive the same conclusion. As theta goes to positive infinity, the negative binomial model converges to Gaussian distribution. Negative binomial distribution converges to the Poisson distribution. All right, let's see that's consistent. We could have derived from the original Poisson gamma setup, the Poisson gamma mixture setup, or we can derive just from this uh, PDF of the two distribution. All right, and another fact is also consistent is this. For a negative binomial distribution, we can derive that the variance is equal to this value, this expression. Okay, the mean is equal to the mu, the variance is equal to this. But again, when theta goes to positive infinity, the variance will converge to theta, which becomes the same as the expected value. Again, converge to the Poisson, right? But when theta is very small, the variance will be much larger than the expected value. Again, everything is consistent for you. Right. So in this sense, negative binomial model is designed to account for this over dispersion problem. But notice that, can it account for under dispersion? Yes or no? No, but it cannot over this, uh, account for, it cannot handle under dispersion problem because by design, we are adding additional variance into the setup, into this Y value. All right, so no way that you can derive like a smaller variance than the expected value from a negative binomial setup. Again, another question I can ask you, right? Okay, so you, you won't be able to say you account for over dispersion, so negative binomial. But because under dispersion, it's not that common, so that's why we worry less about that. So over dispersion is uh, what uh, we should uh, worry. So that's why we, we consider this more. Right. Okay, so that's uh, what we can do. 
All right, so, but of course, a final, a final note, which is also very uh, important, is that although we feel like, okay, the Poisson model may not fit the data that well, right, so the data is over this graph. But actually, it's a very important for you to keep in mind is that, yeah, this goes back to your question, why do we still use Poisson model? Why is Poisson model still the most popular way to model current data problems? Is this, think about that. Even if, let's say, negative binomial model is true, take a look at it. What is the expected value of negative binomial model? Still mu. All right, still the same as Poisson model. This is very important. So that means, even if Poisson model cannot properly account for this over dispersion problem, but what, what, where is the problem? Only in terms of estimating the variance. But in estimating the mu expected value of y, Poisson model is still correct. All right, even if you have dispersion in your data, Poisson model is still correct in terms of estimating the expected value of your y counts. All right, so in this sense, only when you are really interested in the variance, okay, you, you can still use, unless you are really interested in, interested in variance, otherwise you can still use Poisson model, even if you have the over dispersion. All right, so that's why you know if you only you are only interested in okay for each customer what is the expected value of minutes of that customer? If you are in, inter only interested in questions like that, you can disregard the potential issue of over this question. Simply use Poisson model to fit the data. You have still have a very consistent estimation of the expected value of minutes for each customer. But when do you need to worry about over this question? When do you need to worry about fitting the data better if it's over this person? Only when you want to know the entire distribution. You want to know that what's the probability of a customer coming for a certain number of times. All right, you want to know the probability of y equal to one, y equal to two, y equal to three, y equal to four. You feel that's what you want to know. Then you want to have a precise estimation of the entire distribution. And then you have to properly account for this uh, over this question. You see, that's depend on what you are interested in. If you only interested in the expected value, then Poisson is very good. Forget about negative binomial model. We don't need to worry about that at all. Just use Poisson to the estimation, even if the data has over this question. All right, but if you want to know the whole distribution, you want to know the exact probability of y taking certain count value, then you have to estimate the whole problem, the distribution properly. And then you have to properly take account for this over dispersion problem by using the negative binomial. All right, so that's an important uh, uh, note to, to, to keep in mind. So yeah, in that sense, Poisson is not so bad, not so big. So finally, how do we estimate and evaluate the model, you know, the model fit? you know, for those models that's estimated using this MLE approach. Are you familiar with those measures called AIC and the VIC, right? So those are the measures that we can use for models estimated based on MLE approach because we have that, uh, you know, when we do, those are the, those are essentially likelihood based measure. You know, it's different from R squared that we talk about for linear regression, right? Those AIC, VIC, those are called information criteria. Okay, this AIC is an Akiata you know, named after a Japanese statistician, AIC, you know, first proposed this measure, AIC. And by VIC is Bayesian information criteria, right? This is Akiata information criteria. So these two information criteria are very similar, you know, very similar. This is like a generalization, like a improvement of based on, you know, beyond the basic AIC. So you see, what, what's the core of that measure? The likelihood, all right? Essentially, that's the likelihood. This is the core. So it's the, basically the negative value of the likelihood. This is the log likelihood. This is the estimated likelihood. So when we do the S, maximize, like, you know, when we do MLE, right, we maximize the likelihood, right, and find the set of uh, coefficient values. So that the maximize the likelihood, maximize the maximize outcome, the maximize the log likelihood becomes the core of this AIC, DIC measure. But you see, it's negative. That means what? We want the likelihood to be the larger, the better, right? So, but the AIC, DIC, actually, the core is 
negative to times the maximized likelihood. So as a result, we want AIC and the BIC to be the small, yeah, to be the smaller the better. All right, remember that. So AIC, BIC, they are always positive because log likelihood will be negative. Log likelihood itself will be negative, but we take the negative, so it's always positive. But we want the positive value to be the smaller the better. All right, so that's the call. But now think about it. In, we want it to be the smaller the better, but what do we have in addition to the maximize the net likelihood? You see, we have those terms. Those terms, this k is equal to what? The number of x variables in a model. And those terms are positive terms added to this AIC guess. As a result, they are essentially what? Penalty term. All right, these are, these are the penalty term for what? For the number of x variables that you have in a model. In other words, if everything else is equal, we want a model with fewer x variables. If you have a model with larger x variables, you would better improve the log likelihood by a lot in order to win in this AIC case. Okay? Otherwise, this one is penalized. The number, additional number of x variables is penalized in this AIC yes. You see, the why BIC is an improvement over AIC. Actually, AIC penalizes the number of parameters less. BIC penalizes that even more because it's penalized by log of n. n is the number of data observations in your model, right? So this is very large. So the penalty term for the, the uh, x variable, number of x variables actually is much larger than what's inside it. Right, so essentially what is AIC and BIC? The maximized likelihood of the model, but penalized by the number of x parameters, x variables in your model. When would you want a smaller penalty for number of variables in the model. So I guess in other words, when would you use AIC over BIC? Uh, yeah, usually people will think BIC is a more reasonable measure because okay. that come that come later, you know, to improve AIC. But right? usually, you know, because we will just measure both. Okay. And the ideally you want, you know, your mod, you know, the final model that you choose, you want them to have that winning AIC and the BIC both. Okay. You know, like a better AIC, smaller AIC measure and also smaller BIC. If two models, like one, you know, has a better AIC measure, one has a better BIC measure, well, that's kind of sort of, um, you know, conflicting. So mm -hmm. that means the model, two per model performance are similar, arguably, you know. Yeah. Similar. But uh, only when the yeah, one model wins in both measures, that's a uh, definite best bet. So when comparing two models and their goodness of fit scores, the just make sure you're comparing the same one, like the number of variables. Yeah, you have to compare AIC versus AIC of the two models, and BIC versus BIC, you know, of the two models. All right, so you can, yeah, you can, don't, do not compare <laughs> AIC to BIC, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, but you wouldn't want one model to have both better AIC and also better yeah. BIC. You, sorry, yeah, my, you would expect them, if a model's better on one, you would expect it to probably be better on the other in most yeah, cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But sometimes it may not, because if the two models' performance is similar, because of that, uh, you know, one model with more x variables may be better in AIC, but worse in BIC. It's simply because the, the weight of penalty is different in these two measures. You see, one model with more x variables may be better in IC, maybe have a smaller AIC value, but they have a larger BIC value, right? Simply because of penalty term. All right. Okay, so that's the. Uh, that's a setting. So, you know, for this reason, we can, once we estimate these two models, Torsum and Nancy Binomial, we can just calculate the AIC and the BIC to compare, right? So that for that data, you can determine which model fits your data. All right, so this is the R functions that we're going to use. So we're going to, let's take a quick look at the, uh, the, 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 the example. So we're going to need to use this package, MASS package, use this to estimate this up. Uh, negative binomial model. There's uh, this function uh, implemented in this package, GLL dot NB, right? To estimate this negative bias. And uh, for the causal model, we, can, we don't need any external package. You see, in the core function of R function, we can just use this uh, GLM. We actually already used the GLM before. Still remember, where did we use GLM? This is also something you should know, right? Because that's the core function you use in the homework exercise. I may ask you, which of the following models can be estimated at using a GLM function? And you should be able to pick one. Okay, which of the, which of the models can be estimated using a GLM function? 
Yeah, logic, right? Logic is the problem that the binary response model can be estimated using the GLI. And here also, possible research. And the only difference is that for that G, uh, for the log in the probit model, what is the family? Remember, what is the family that we specify? Binomial. Binomial, exactly, binomial, because the outcome variable is bi binary, right? So it's binomial model. But uh, here, the outcome variable is a count. So we use this uh, Poisson as a family. All right, so they all fall under this uh, so-called generalized linear model. Actually, this is a very broad umbrella. I incorporate a lot of commonly, you know, commonly very useful, you know, commonly useful models. So you can actually um, take a course. You know, there's uh, those books just specialized uh, introducing this uh, generalized linear model framework. So basically, yeah, it's a very uh, sort of general framework, right? You just do the, you know, different parts of this model. You change different forms for the link function, you know, for those uh, different uh, components, and you can derive at a different, totally different type of. So yeah, so very useful. If we had time, we could have, yeah, just offer one course, the whole full semester long course, just focusing on this generalized linear model framework. Right, yeah, again, I encourage you to kind of delve into uh, that. Okay, now let's take a quick look at it. I have already created a, a demo video for this part, so I have already posted on the uh, canvas, and I'll post the homework uh, for this topic after class today. Alright, so we start to work on that. But both this one and the next one uh, uh, is uh, relatively short. So the homework has, you know, emphasizes per se shouldn't be too hard, but make sure you understand the concept involved. So you know the data for this demonstration, what we use is this uh, so-called morbid data again for each customer, right? So in each month, how many times you know he or she visited this uh, this uh, shopping mall, and then we have the historical data. Right? And then we have this x variable, you know, this uh, degree of discount, you know, uh, uh, applied in each month, right, in, in each shop. And uh, whether the customer has received a targeted promotional email during that month or not. And then these are the various uh, information about each customer, how far he or she is living, you know, from this uh, shopping mall, and the income level, the gender. All right, so then we want to create a model to predict the expected value of visits to the mall you know, within a month. All right? So again, count uh, data model are designed to, you know, to model you know, something that will lead to that count, right? So the expected value of the count. All right, so then we can just, uh, fit. of course, you know, what we can do is uh, we can read in the data, right? And then we can create the histogram of this Y variable. As you can see, right, so the majority of the data is concentrated on the small values, zero and one, right, for most customers, uh, you know, no business, maybe, you know, some kind of be, and for the other values, very small. All right, so that's why you cannot use the linear regression. The linear regression model will be a very poor approximation for distribution of values like that. So we need to do the also, you know, the count data model. So then how to estimate the Poisson regression? To estimate the Poisson regression, it's very simple. Syntax-wise, it's very simple. GLM. All right, GLM function. Again, you don't need any package. And then we specify the model. The model is specified as usual, usual model specification. The dependent variable, QDA, and all the independent variable that you want to include. Here, our data is very simple, so we can include all the variables you know, as the independent variable. So for those cases, you can simply put a dot there. All right, dot simply means all the other X variables. Okay, but of course you can spell them out. If you don't want to include everything, right, you can use the plus, you know, list all the variables in the plus. Or alternatively, you can also use dot and minus sign, exactly. If I want to include everything other than one column, then you just dot and minus, minus the name of the variable that you want to exclude. Okay? Okay? So this is the model specific. And then, as I said, the family, now you need to specify that as Poisson, right? And then specify the data. Now for the Poisson, you don't need to specify the link function, just, just the family group. And that's it. That's the, how you specify the estimation of this uh, Poisson regression. And then save all for the two variables. And then we can just run. Let's see, for the Poisson distribution, Poisson regression is pretty clear, right? So it has a little bit delay, but almost, almost instant. 
So the negative binomial model will take a little bit longer than that. All right, because you need to run that type of numerical search. So even for a smaller data set that, like that, you may take more than one second to, to, to do that. So uh, that, uh, that spot certainly, you know, uh, takes longer than you use So that's it. So the model is estimated. So that's why, you know, if you only want to run the model, it's very simple, right? Not you know, just one line of code. So but you need to know what's happening you know, behind that, right? So what's the theory, what's the, you know, framework, all right, you know, for that model. So that's why, you know, we need to know all the basics before actually apply that in R. Okay, then we can just summarize that and take a look at the estimation now. As you see, that's the, as usual, you have the estimates of all the coefficient. All right, so the coefficient, those are all the beta coefficients in front of all the x variables that we have in and that's the usual value. But this is a z value. You know, this is not the t, the t value. What's the, what is z value? That's very similar, basically similar to t value, but z value is just that normal distribution. It's not, it doesn't follow the student t distribution. So it's a, a so-called asymptotic approximation. All right, but you don't yeah, need to worry about it. Basically, you just, you can think of pretty much the same. You know, the other test, the t test, this, this is test. It's not no longer the t-test, but the, the idea is the same. This is the, sort of the p-value. Uh, this is the p-value. So, anyway, you know those stars, that's significant. Right? Again, indicates significance. So you can see that for the, all the variables that we have encoded, the discount is significant. So that means discount has the impact on the number of bits. Now think about that. What sign should discount take? Should the coefficient for this count take? The discount level, right? So larger means deeper discount going on in that mode. So it will lead to more bits, right? So more bits lead to the higher expected value of bits. So the coefficient in front of this count should be positive. All right. So L is small by nature because it's small count. So, you know, what, what we're talking about is that E lambda, right, is equal to exponential of X and beta. So, right, so the level itself, the value itself should be small because expected value of lambda is supposed to be small, right? So usually, you know, less than one, you know, zero point or something. So that's why it's, it's normal. Then how do you interpret this beta coefficient? Remember, we talk about that. What's the interpretation of beta coefficient? So, for example, what does this point at 0, 0, 0, 8 mean? Remember, what's that beta co What's the interpretation of beta coefficient in the Poisson model? Again, that's also something I may ask you later. What's that? Exactly, exactly. Right. So, the marginal impact on the the percentage in change. All right, that means one unit change in this x variable will change the expected value of the count by that much percent. So how much percent it is? 0.08 percent. All right, so one increase, you know, unit increase in that discount measure will increase the expected value of visits by 0.8 percent. All right, that's uh, what it means. Okay, uh, yeah, that's the other thing you can, uh, you can, uh, yeah, distance, distance is negative, right? The farther the person lives from this mall, right? The fewer, the smaller the expected number of bits that the person will move to the mall, right? That's also normal, that's negative. And income level, the impact is positive. Okay, so that's how we, we run this model. Okay, so next one is that we want to calculate the, that measure, that uh, dispersion measure, to check whether we have over dispersion problems or not. Right, so remember we have this uh, statistic that we can quickly examine to determine whether it's. Uh, this. Uh, this one, right? This measure. 
we can test to see whether we have the over dispersion problem in the data or not. So this estimate this value and then to see if it's a, uh, larger than one or not. So how to do that? You already have the formula. You can just basically add it to the formula in R. Okay? So here this thing is first you need to estimate this y hat. How to estimate this y hat? Like I said, the y hat is this one. So you can get this y hat and expect the value of y from the Poisson model using this predict function. All right, the predict function. But again, pay attention here, just like what we did with the binary response model. Well, to predict that, you need to set type equal to response. Then you get the expected value of y as this nonlinear function of x beta. If you don't set type equal to response, what you get is just the x beta itself. All right, same as what you did with the binary response with, with the logic and the probing model, uh, the logic and probing model. So have that in type equal to response will give you the probability of y equal to one in a logical regression. Right here, type equal to response will give you the expected value of y, which is equal to exponential of x beta in the Poisson model. All right, so this will give you the expected value of y, so y hat. And then we simply added this uh, formula. Once you have this y hat, you simply added this formula. This is yi minus y hat squared over y hat. So, like what we just did here. You see, y minus y, you can derive it, just derive that uh, extracted from the original data, right? y minus y hat squared divided by y hat. Right, but here, what are all those variables, y and y hat? They are all vectors. All right, that contains all the yi and all the y hat i. All right, these are vectors. So you do the you do the subtraction, you do the division. These are all vectorized calculation or element-wise calculation. So the result of this one, what I'm highlighting here, is also a vector. So then we do the sum. All right, basically just adding up all the elements in that. So essentially, what we get out of this this part is what what which part in this formula is this one. All right, so you add up this, this is the sum, so you add up everything. Is that clear? So make sure you understand this is how we call our works, right? This is what makes R very easy to use, very powerful, right? For those vectorized calculations, you simply write a, you know, a simple formula like that. All right, you see this one, a y, the y hat, you don't have i, right? But it contains all the i, right? Because itself is a vector. And then you do the sum. Basically, it's the sum, the, the sum over all i's. Okay. And then finally, you derive that by this one. So make sure you understand what is this coefficient. That's the degree of freedom adjustment. That's this one. That's n minus k minus one. All right. So n is the number of observations in your data. So that's why we use n row in our data set. That's the n, right? The number of uh, observations. And how do we get k plus one? You see, we use this one, right? So the coefficient, you know, this coefficient function give you the coefficient estimates from your Poisson model. And then we pick the length of that vector. So that gives you the number of coefficients in the Poisson model. Again, what's the number of coefficients in the Poisson model? K plus one. All right, K is the number of x variables plus one plus the intercept. So this is K plus one is the number of beta coefficients in the Poisson model. Right? We said that the Poisson model, the number of coefficients K plus one. But the next binomial model, you need to estimate one more coefficient, right? Which is that theta. So that's K plus two. But here it's K plus one. So, so this is n. This is minus k plus one. So that corresponds to this uh, n minus k minus one. All right, so basically this whole expression is calculated at uh, sigma square estimate. All right, so let's just uh, run that to see what value we get. You see, for this data set that we are working on for this demonstration, the coefficient that the sigma square estimate is 
very close to what? All right, which indicates what? What does that mean? If that theta square hat is very close to one, what does that mean? Is there over dispersion in our data here? No. Okay, that means no over dispersion. But in the homework, what the data said in the homework, actually, you should have a very large sigma square. Right? There is indeed an over dispersion. So let's uh, just do that. Okay, so that's uh, sigma. So for this data, that means Poisson model is good, uh, good enough. All right, we don't really need to go with negative binomial. But still, let's uh, fit a negative binomial model here. So to fit a negative binomial, you need to use this uh, MASS package. So first, install that package and then load the package using library. And then run this uh, this function, glm.nb. Again, that's very simple. The syntax is very simple. Just the usual model specification, right? And then specify the data. And then we can run this. Take a look, take a look at it. When I run that, it takes like more than a second to run this uh, model. You see, you're gonna see uh, some feeling. So that's you know for you know this is a very small data set, right? Very simple model, but still you get a little bit longer than usual. So that's the you know it takes more time to take them because the, the the likelihood is more complex for negative binomial. All right, and then we can run the summary to get to the output. All right, that's the same. You know, the same number of the, the coefficients. You can look at the result. <coughs> the, 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 the value should be consistent with what you get. It should be very similar to what you get from the Poisson model. Simply because the, you know, there's no over dispersion, so the two models eventually should be uh, very close. All right, and but the here, pay attention to one more coefficient here, theta, okay, which is estimated here. You see here, theta is said, it's large, right? It's over 10. It's large. So large theta means what? No over dispersion, right? So one over theta measures the variance. So theta is large, so that means uh, you know little over dispersion in this case. So again, that's consistent. And then now we can compare AIC and the PIC. All right, compare the model fit of the two models. So very simple. The function, the name is simply just called AIC and the BIC. Again, that's incorporated in the core R installation. You don't even need to use any additional package to do the package. Just supply the estimation result from the Poisson regression and from the negative binomial regression. And you can just C1 basically just co list the two values. So again, compare AIC to AIC, compare BIC to BIC. See, these are the AIC and these are the BIC. The value should be close, right? The two close AIC should be close. And uh, like I said, the way to compare them is the smaller one, the better, right? So they are all positive, so the smaller the better. So actually this one is a little bit better. So negative binomial model is a little bit better. But that's the, 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 the difference is the negative. So basically it's very, very close. That's expected because there's no uh, over dispersion in this case. But if you have over dispersion, then the negative binomial model will fit better. All right, so the last one I ask you to do is to plot that uh, probability distribution. All right, the probability is so basically just to plot the PBM function based on the two models, also model and the negative binomial. So let's do that. But how to plot the, the probability? Based on the Poisson model, what is the probability of say y equal to zero, y equal to one, y equal to two? How do we calculate that? Again, you should be able to, without looking at any slide, any note, any book, you should be able to describe that in, in, in plain language. Right? How to get the, so I give you, uh, you all, all know all the beta, everything. Then how do we calculate that? Distribute, how do we draw that distribution? The probability of y equal to 0, y equal to 1, y equal to 2. How do we do that? Exactly, PDF, right? So the PDF, but in order to do that, the PDF, for the Poisson model, the PDF is the, just that, that Poisson distribution, right? The probability following that Poisson distribution. But the, what information do we need in order to, for us to determine the exact value for probability of y equal to 1, y equal to 0? What information do we need? The lambda, right? So, but then what is the what is the value of lambda? For Poisson model, it's the exponential of x beta. 
So that means we need to know not only the beta, but also the x values. All right, so keep in mind, so in, in the small Poisson model, negative binomial model, all the distribution depends on the x variables values. So you have to first select what x values you are evaluating at. You need to specify that. Right, so here for us, the purpose if we want, just want to plot the general distribution, what do you think, you know, how should we pick the x values? The natural choice would be just taking that mean value of all x variables from your data. All right, so that's what we want to do. Just take the mean value of all x variables in your data. So do the column mean from your original data, right? Six, the second column, so uh, three, six columns, those are the x variables. The first column is, is used as the y variable. So we take all those column means and save them as x bar. All right, so as we can see this x bar, you can take a quick look at the x bar. So those are the mean values for these uh, several x variables. So now we'll evaluate all the lambda, all the probabilities at these x variable values, right, at this x bar. And then we simply do the x beta, right, so multiply these x values with the beta coefficients. So that's what we are doing here. All right, so the x beta, the beta coefficients need to be extracted from your estimation result. So for Poisson model, we extract those beta coefficients using this COVID function from the Poisson estimation result. Right, so these are the, all the beta hat from the Poisson regression. And uh, combine them, multiply them with this x bar. But here, why do we add a what in front of x bar? For the intercept, exactly. You have this, uh, you know, in the coefficient this time, the first one is beta zero. So we need to add a what to match that. All right, and then we do the cross product. Cross product is simply, you know, two vectors, cross product of two vectors. Simply, we just take the product of each element of the two vectors and then add them together. All right, so that's essentially just, uh, you know, beta zero, right, times one plus beta one times x one plus beta two times x two plus this. All right, this is just a cross of product. So that is a, it, it essentially just give you the x times beta, you know, the x beta mean x beta. So this is about the Poisson, and then we do the same for negative binomial, all right? And yet we have the k, you know, for this uh, plot, we want to plot the probability of k to the 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way, right? So we create a vector from 0 to 10, you know, as all the possible k values. And then now we are ready to plot that distribution. So how do we get the distribution? So the PDF, right? And how do we get the PDF? The D function. Remember for a distribution, right, the D function. So for Poisson, the density function, PDF function of Poisson distribution, we just use the D poise. All right, so that's the density function of Poisson distribution. So then for all the distribution of all those different K values from zero all the way to 10, right? And then we just specify that distribution parameter for Poisson distribution. For Poisson distribution, there's only one parameter, which is lambda. And lambda is set to this exponential of S beta as we just calculated. So we just do that. And for negative binomial distribution, the PDF is D N binomial. Okay, so that's the density of a negative binomial. Again, for all the k values, and negative binomial model, there are two distribution parameters. One is uh, mu, right, the mean. The other one is theta, the dispersion. All right, so pay attention. The name, our argument name, is a little bit different. Mu is mu. The theta is called the size. All right, so mu is just the exponential of x beta. Size is the s made the theta from the, linear, uh, the negative binomial regression result. So we do that. And then we just plot both of them onto the plot. All right, using the two different type of dots so that uh, we can see clearly. So the solid dots are for negative binomial, the hollow dots are for the bottom. You see these two, the distribution, is very close to each other, almost overlap with each other, which is expected, right? Because there's no uh, over dispersion, so the two models essentially are the same. So that's why you see uh, it's, uh, it's, it's almost overlap. But if you have over dispersion, then the distribution of the probability is estimated from two models, which is quite different. That's what you'll see in the homework. Okay. So based on this distribution, what can we say? How can you read this? That means the probability of an average customer, right, with the average, the mean value of all the x variables, the probability of a customer coming to this mall 
you know, the number of uh, times this customer coming to this net in one month equal to zero is about over 60%. The problem of that customer coming to the mall once in a month is about 30%, and so on so forth. All right, this is doing on the average level, but if you are interested in a particular customer with a particular set of X variables, you could do the same, right? But just evaluate the probability at that level, the, the, the X values of that particular customer. And you can get the whole distribution. All right, okay, so much for today. And uh, yeah, like I said, I'll post the questions uh, this afternoon and start to work on that. Okay, we'll talk about the next topic. All right, see you next time.